This morning I want to talk to you about the hope of Christmas. The hope that is in Christmas, the hope we have of a Christmas, the hope of a Savior, the hope of, of all that we celebrate in the coming of Jesus Christ. That song the choir just sang about the wise men. Do you know why they rejoiced with great joy? Because they were traveling, they were seeking, and they were searching with an expectant, hopeful heart that they would find what they were looking for. And folks, I want to tell you, one of the great elements that's missing today in the church, that's missing in the worship and missing in the individual lives of believers is a lack of that expectation that God is at work around us and that we can become a part of that work. When we gather together in the church, we come expecting to hear from the Lord. Did you, did you prepare your heart this morning and ask the Lord, Lord, would you speak to me today? Lord, would you pin me to the wall if I need to be? Lord, would you convict me of something? Would you show me your way? Did we come and spend any amount of time in preparing our hearts to hear from the Lord, either in Sunday school, in worship, in singing, uh, in testimony, in anything that we do? The expectancy is a part of the hope of the believer, the part of the hope of the believer. And I may have a different text than y'all have. I hope I don't, but uh, we're going to open in Luke chapter 2. Is that a different one than y'all have? Okay. Okay, good. Luke chapter 2, but we're going to look at verse 22. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. I changed this in my notes, and I, well, I wasn't sure if I told the guys in the back that I did that. I've done that before. <laughs> Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. This does not sound like a Christmas text because it happens after the birth of Jesus some days as uh, they went to present him to the temple. Beginning in verse 22, Luke chapter 2. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. By the way, uh, this would have shown that uh, Mary and Joseph was, were very poor uh, because God made amends for uh, those that did not have anything that they could offer the, uh, the turtle doves or the pigeons. Verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So Simeon came by the Spirit in the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. I want to read from Colossians chapter 1, Paul speaking of this hope, this expectation, this mystery. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that your word would speak to our heart today, that we would leave here with an understanding of the hope that is ours in Christ, the hope that's involved in the message of Christmas, the expectant, supernatural, godly hope that is ours to practice day in and day out, even when things are hard. Lord, I pray if there's any here today that don't have hope, those that are discouraged, those that have become disillusioned, 
those that are lost in their way, that feel like they're just going through the motions and wandering. Lord, I pray for them especially today that you might restore into their heart and into their spirit and soul the expectancy of a relationship. Lord, the joy of knowing you and serving you. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray, through thy word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the little gospel track that was, a part, that, that was connected to your bulletin this morning, the first paragraph uh, uh, speaks about this time of the year. And for some, it is a great time. Uh, uh, there's, there's folks that just love to give gifts, to buy gifts. Uh, some people like to get gifts. There, there are times that families get together. Uh, there are celebrations, there are traditions. We decorate, we go through all the trappings of, of these, these few weeks of, of just lifting up and celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ. And it is something to be celebrated. And in that little gospel track, it, it kind of talks about the saying, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And for some, it is the most wonderful time of the year. But I'm going to tell you, for many, it's not. For many, it's not. For many, these are some of the most difficult days of the year. Those that have lost loved ones, those that are grieving, financial hardship, loss of jobs, uh, a realization of, of how tough times can get. You know, in all of my life, I go back and I remember uh, uh, probably the second Christmas after my parents had divorced, uh, uh, I mean, we, we just didn't have anything. And I, my mother, God bless her, she worked so hard trying to provide for three big old boys. And she would do without, and she would give, and, and it's just her nature. And I wanted to get her something for Christmas so bad, but we didn't have anything. And at that time, there was a Goodwill store on Canal Street. Some of you guys had been around picking a long time, remember that. Judy, I think it was across the street from First National, somewhere right there. I, Seems like the building might be torn down now. I, I can't even remember. But I remember going in that Goodwill, and I was looking for something for Christmas, and I found a, a reindeer with the eye missing. It was a little brooch, and uh, uh, it was simple. It was cheap. But I got that, and I gave that to my mother. And as far as I know, she probably still has it, but she wore that every Christmas. But it didn't cost but a quarter. And I remember that that day. And, and, you know, I look back on that, and it really becomes the spirit of giving when you don't have anything, but you have a desire. Tracy speaks of a time when she was a little girl when, when things were hard and Don was between jobs. Don, you remember that Christmas? And it uh, uh, wasn't going to be a Christmas, but, but Don was working and, and struggling and scraping and went up and bought and found stuff, and he repaired it and fixed it up and painted it. And they had a wonderful Christmas. And... And Tracy looks back at that Christmas as one of her highlights. And so it's not in the extravagant. It's not in all the, the, the trappings and the spending and, and volumes. It's the heart. It's the heart of giving, which is captured in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave. And we, we, we should take that and let that become the center of Christmas. We really should. It is, it is the giving. But what I want us to do even more than that is to understand the hope that is involved in this message of Christmas. Now, the scriptures say that he was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, go back in, the, in, in Genesis, and you'll remember in the Garden of Eden, God would come in the cool of the day, and he fellowship with his created uh, Adam and Eve. He, he would spend time with them, and he would fellowship with them. And then sin entered the picture. And what happened at that point? Man was driven away from the presence and that fellowship with God. And when God said, thou shalt surely die, man died in their spiritual relationship with the Lord. And they no longer had that communion and that intimate uh, time with him. Sin had separated that. And we go through the Old Testament and we see through the sacrifices, we see through the law, we see through uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, we see again and again and again, uh, even in the temple, where God is establishing 
a place where he can reveal his presence. But even then, only the high priest uh, in the tabernacle and in the temple, only the high priest could enter into the very holy of holies, into the very presence of God, and even then only once a year. But God's desire was that man and God would be reunited in relationship and fellowship, in communion. And this is what began. This is the impetus of the, the seed of woman that would crush the head of the serpent. And we live on the other side of the birth of Christ. We live on the other side where Emmanuel, God with us, came to pass. And now we can have that intimate relationship with the Lord again. It is the most precious, special thing. But we take it so for granted. When you read the Old Testament, they longed. Well, you go and read. Go and read uh, in Hebrews uh, about faith. And they, they longed for that time. They, they yearned for that moment. And they died never seeing that promise. But they died believing that it was coming. And here we are today. And we live in the midst of him coming. We live in the midst of the coming of Christ. As I was driving here this morning, old dreary rain, I have to admit, I was a little pessimistic. I was. I had to guard myself about it. Uh, uh, I, I hate rainy Sundays. <laughs> it's, it's, I know somebody told me today, well, we need the rain. Yeah, it could rain after Sunday. It could, it could rain in the afternoon. Just some about the morning rain just deters so many from coming to worship. And I wanted so many to hear the, the truth of this message today. So I had to kind of guard against the pessimism. And as I was driving, I kind of had three words. That, that say, and I, that when you're a preacher, and I preach in threes almost always, I have three points, and it's just I've done this all my, all my preaching time. But three words kind of came to my heart, and I, I said, I'm going to make a sermon out of that. And, uh, and I, I saved it in my, all this fancy stuff. You tell it to save stuff, and it will. I don't even know how it works. It just works. And uh, so, so I, I, I told uh, my, my smartphone to save something so dumb me won't forget it. But basically, I, I kind of thought to myself, you know, we come to the most exciting, joyful, celebratory time in the life of the church. The only thing that I could think of that could eclipse the joy of Emmanuel, God with us, is it is finished and Jesus' death on the cross and then he is risen. There, there's, there's only two things that I can think of that, 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 uh, that could be as great as Jesus with us, Emmanuel, the birth. And I said, you know, it just seems today that too many preachers are having to plead, plead with their congregations to be excited that Jesus has come. And then we find ourselves trying to placate those who... Uh, refused uh, uh, to be encouraged. It's almost like uh, uh, I'm here, do something to make me want to be here or I'll find somewhere else. We live in that day today where, where the preachers, instead of proclaiming and presenting and doing the things that, that's a joy, they're having to placate and, and trying to make everybody happy. You can't do it. You can't do it. So they're pleading and placating, uh, trying to keep things rolling today. And folks, this time of the year, we all have, we all have, I mean, we really should. Christians should come in mass to worship the Lord. We really should. It is one of the great times of the year. And it is uh, what we're here today to celebrate. We can look back and we see where all the prophecies, all the things of Jesus have come to pass. We have no excuse not to be aware and celebrate and to know. It's, it, it, we have no excuse. So what we can do is we can practice. We can spend that time. We can celebrate this birth. And in doing that, I'm telling you, our hearts will be lifted. And in doing that, we will encourage others who need to hear this message so badly. Have you ever had to just wait? Uh, the kids are in children's church, right? I'd ask them, but... Uh, we were over at uh, uh, my daughter's yesterday for a birthday party, and the girls were showing me the Christmas tree. And I said, well, the tree is beautiful, but there's something missing, girls. And they said, what, Papa? And they're looking all over the tree. I said, there's no presents under that tree. we got to get some presents under that tree. I mean, that's the expectant part of Christmas, isn't it? To go by and look. I can't even put a present out when my wife's around. 
she'll shake it till she breaks it. And I'm convinced that she'll open it and then tape it back up where I can't tell. She cannot stand to wait. So we always have our Christmas a month in advance usually. Because <laughs> I like to give. I just like to give presents. That's fun. So that's the joy of Christmas. But when you wait on something, and I'm going to use the gift on the tree. I mean, I mean, if you don't know what it is and don't have any idea and you're somewhat excited about it, that anticipation grows and grows and grows. And a kid that you can't get out of bed until one minute before 8 on Christmas morning will bounce out of that bed at 5 a.m. Why? That's expectancy. It makes a difference in our lives. Folks, I want to tell you something. It makes a difference in your worship, in your walk. It makes a difference in your testimony. It makes a difference in your attitude and your joy. When you're expecting God to be at work in your life and you're looking for him, it will make a great place and it will encourage you. That expectancy is hope. Amen. It's hope. It's what that is. Now, sometimes you wait for things and it doesn't happen. And that's always a discouragement, isn't it? Man, I've had hope in things that this, to this day haven't come to pass. That doesn't mean it's a misplaced hope. It doesn't mean that it's a lost hope. we got all ways of describing it. I, I could make it real fancy and say it's a hope that hasn't been realized yet. And I, I, can, I can decorate it and trap it up. But this isn't the hope that comes for the believer. There's a totally different kind. Like, like last night when I was looking at the weather, I said, oh, I hope it don't rain tomorrow. <laughs> I did. There's nothing I can do about it. If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. I, can't, I can hope all I want. I, we, we can be around a bunch of sick people, you know, and, and you say, well, I hope I don't get sick. Well, that's okay. But believer's hope is very different. The believer's hope, the hope that Simeon had, the hope the wise men had and the hope in Christ that I hope you have is a supernatural expectancy. It's not based on what we're able to do and it's not based on what we're not able to do. It is based on the word of God. It is based on the will of God. It is based on the power of God and it is based on the sovereignty of God. That's what our hope is based on. It's nothing that we possess that we can make, I guess, maybe manufacture, but we can possess it in Christ. And so this is the hope that Simeon had. Now, I don't know that Simeon knew that that was the day that he would lay his eyes on the consolation of Israel. That is the Messiah, the Redeemer. But the Holy Spirit had led him to the temple. And the Bible, look, Pentecost hadn't happened yet. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit was, was on Simeon. So God's Spirit, which, which, listen, let me tell you what that, it represents the presence, it represents the possession of God, the Spirit, uh, Spirit seals us under the day of our redemption. But it also uh, uh, shows the equipping of God, the empowering of God, uh, all the things that come with a New Testament believer when we're saved, we're sealed in the Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit, and we're led by the Spirit, and we're empowered and gifted by the Spirit. Simeon was, was already a participant of these things. He was an old man. I guarantee you he came every single day to the temple to worship, and it wasn't out of a, of a, of a mundane experience or something that he had to do. He wanted to be there. He wanted to be there. He wanted to see the Redeemer. And then that day finally came. And I, don't, I, wish, I wish we had more than we have here. I, and I don't want to add anything to it. But, but I guarantee you, he knew Jesus when he saw him because he went, hey, new parents, how do you feel when somebody comes and snatches your baby out of your hands? <laughs> Son, if somebody came to snatch my grandson out of uh, her mama, uh, they're going to have a fight. Mamas, mamas, Haley, you were like that, weren't you? Don't snatch my kid out of my hands. Tracy will hurt you. <laughs> it, uh, mamas are very protective. Now, you would think in church it would maybe be a little bit different, but, but here they come in. Mary and Joseph have got to still be reeling by everything they've experienced. The angelic host, the shepherds, the wise men, 
all the things that they're seeing about this baby that was born, it's got to be overwhelming. And then they go into church to follow after the law and to have the child dedicated, to, to offer the sacrifices, uh, uh, to, to make sure that, that they follow after what God's Word says. They're very careful to do that. And here comes this old man, grabs the baby, and basically prophesies as he shares his heart. That culmination of Simeon's hope was found when he held that baby in his hands. He said, my eyes have seen the salvation of God. Now, folks, that's a sermon in and of itself. My eyes have seen the salvation of God. Jesus Christ was born to save. But listen to me. To save, he had to die. So we can, we can say easily that Jesus Christ was born to die, to pay the price for our sins so that we might be saved. Simeon exclaimed that in just one sentence. And it was a beautiful proclamation. Simeon represents all believers that have this expectant hope that's based upon God's promise. Folks, when, when we come to that time in our life where we give our hearts to Christ, when we repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord saves us and cleanses us and forgives us, we begin a journey that's going to be uh, uh, all the way until forever. But on this earth, we have a hope then. And I want to talk to you a little bit about where this hope comes from. Tonight, by the way, I'm going to share a message uh, about hope again. I've been trying to kind of do two-part messages on these words of Christmas. But tonight, I want to talk to you about where do I find hope when everything's falling apart? Where, where do I find hope when I feel hopeless? And I'm going to share that with you tonight, okay? But where does our hope come from? Now, we see in Simeon, as he held up Jesus, it was in the Lord. But listen, I want to read some scriptures to you. Just listen to these scriptures. So where does this, this expectant, supernatural believer's hope come from? Psalm 39, 7 says, and so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Do you hear the words of the psalmist? I mean, we can put our hope in a lot of different places. We can put our hope in our own abilities. We can put our hope in what we can or can't do. We can put our hope in those that may be authority figures over us and depend on them. We can put our hope in our doctors. We can put our hope. I mean, there's so many different places that we can lay our hope down. But the psalmist came to the conclusion that the only place that I can put my hope that matters, that is secure, is with you and you alone, Lord. Psalm 71, 5, the psalmist says, O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from childhood. The Lord and the relationship to the Lord is our greatest source of all hope that we could ever have. And when we trust him and believe in him and yearn for him, and obey Him, and live for Him, and we're saved by Him, it secures a future of hope. No matter what we might face, nothing can take that hope from us that is ours in Christ Jesus. This hope is grounded, by the way, in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. It is absolutely grounded. First Peter says this, Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Do you hear that? The hope that we have is secured in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Folks, when you're saved, you have believed on Jesus Christ as the one who died. You believe that the blood that was shed would cleanse your sin. You've repented of sin and you've come to him. You've confessed him and called upon him to save you. And in that point, our hope is secure and grounded. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we read these verses. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay, there is wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Peter writing to a persecuted church, 
hey, things are bad right now. You may have lost your home, your livelihood. You may have been driven from your uh, place of birth. You may have been driven from the town you only knew. Things may be bad for you right now, but we have a hope that endures. And even though you've got to endure these trials, don't lose sight of what's been done in and for you through Jesus Christ. It is a wonderful, wonderful promise. So how does this kind of hope help me live through each day? I mean, what is it? Well, you and I both know, and if you haven't, I'm not enlightening you on anything right now, but I don't know about you guys, but we seem to be living in a pretty evil, violent time. It just seems to be that way. We, we seem to be living in a day that, that is beyond, let me just say, I can't speak for you, I'll speak for me. It is beyond my ability to understand how vile and wicked and backwards we've become. I don't have words for it. I, I, I can't even fathom the thinking that goes on today. And it's not just the United States. It's this world. We seem to have lost our ever-loving minds. Well, listen, listen to what Titus says, chapter 2. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. So, so, so the hope that we have even in the times so unsettling as today, in the wickedness and the vileness and the evil that's in this world today, the violence and everything that we see daily, we still look forward to a time when Jesus Christ returns, and he will. We were talking about go tell, what's, what's one of the, we sang go tell on the mountain. You, what was the other one? There was one that stood out, and I, my mind just went blank. Song in the air. Song in the air. What was the other one? I'm putting you on the spot now. I'm sorry. Bethlehem. Little town of Bethlehem. We were singing a song in one of the courses. I mean, one of the verses just rang out to me how important it is. When we, oh, it was, it was the choir special. That's where it was. I'm alive from here down. I kind of wonder about this end a lot. Folks, listen. The hope that drove and the joy that drove those wise men to see Jesus, we should have that same ability and concern and dedication. Jesus has already been born. He died, he buried, resurrected, he's ascended. He's not on this earth anymore. So what do we we need to be looking with great fervent hope for that eastern sky to crack? and for Jesus Christ to return. It could come at any moment, at any time, and it will happen, folks. Just as Simeon waited to the day that he was to see Jesus, I wait for the day when the trumpet of God will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then they that remain will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord and to be with him forever. That's the hope that I have today in the midst of all of this evil world. Folks, when things are rough on this earth, the hope that we have in Christ will enable us to look beyond the evil and the violence and the vile and to look into eternity and know that we have a place there with the Lord. And all the evil and all the other won't be there, okay? 1 John chapter 3 says this, And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. This expectation and hope that we have in Christ will help us to live our lives in a way that honors Him. It makes a difference in how we live each day. Paul talks about running the race, and he talks about fixing my eye on Jesus, the prize. He, he, he ran his life and lived his life bullet straight. He, he didn't want to veer. He, he wanted to be laser straight with Jesus as his goal and his guide. And folks, when we have that expectant hope of the return of Christ, when we have that expectant hope of our eternity with Christ, we can run that same race. And we can do so with all the temptation around us and all the things that clamor for our attention. We can do so without losing our focus. And we can live in a way and live straight as we wait for that time when we'll be with Him. You do know in heaven there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no death. 
and it's just amazing. I mean, that's our hope, folks. There's no suffering. Now, I'm going to preach tonight about maintaining hope in discouraging circumstances, but I want to close with just a couple of verses. Romans 12 says, Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep on praying. Psalm 31 says, So be strong and courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31, one of my favorite verses, But they who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. So how can this believer's hope maintain me when I'm discouraged? Well, you wait patiently and quietly for God to do what only God can do. And you will learn that he will, he will come through. He will come through. I had someone share with me this week, in the midst of fiery trials, I have learned to trust in the Lord like I never have. Wouldn't have learned to trust in the Lord were it not for the fiery trials. God uses those trials to reveal himself and to show us that he is faithful. And he is faithful. So we can do that, folks. We can trust in him. The verses also tell us that while we're doing that, we should rejoice. What should we rejoice in? Times are hard, preacher. We rejoice that we're saved. We rejoice that eternity's ours. We practice patience. <laughs> well, I don't have patience, Brother Bud. If you're saved, you do. You may not practice it, but you got it. Practice patience. And then in my notes, I put, for me, pray, pray, pray. Not just one time. We got to pray all the time, don't we? You know what prayer is ultimately? I know it's talking to God and communing with God, and it's very important. We talk a lot about prayer. If I asked you to raise your hand if you believe in prayer, every hand in here would go up. If I said, how many, time, how many people spend more than 30 minutes a day in prayer, most hands would go down. We believe in prayer, we acknowledge prayer, we know it's important, we know it's something we should practice. But you know what the average prayer time is for most believers in a 24 hour period? It's about three minutes, and that's pushing it. What happens when we're praying? I'll tell you what happens. We're humbling ourselves before God. We're showing that we have need, which reminds us that we have need. And we're going to the only source that can truly help us in any situation of life. And I'm telling you, we need to pray, pray, pray. So when times are difficult, learn to do that. Romans 15 says, Such things were written in the Scripture long ago to teach us. The Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. The Scriptures. Read the Word. Learn to apply it. Let it mold and build your life. Learn to hold to God's promises. That's expectant believer's hope, and it will make a profound difference in your life. Simeon, who was hoping for and seeking the Messiah, led by God, filled with the Holy Spirit, gives us a look into the heart of a fulfilled, satisfied believer. Expectant hope led him to peace that would take Simeon all the way through his moment of death unto eternal life. He said, according to your word, he said, I can depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. Emmanuel, God with us, just like Eden before sin entered our picture. Can you tell me this morning that you're experiencing the Lord in your life? Do you have fellowship with him? Do you have hope? Is it a hope that can transcend your circumstances and your trials? Do you have hope of an eternal security, a hope of ever, forever with the Lord? Do you have the hope that your sins have been covered and cleansed and that you belong to the Lord God? You can today. You know, the Bible says it's not in God's interest nor his desire that any perish, but that all come 
to have that everlasting life. That's God's desire. Now, God knows that many won't, but it's, it's, their, it's their choice. It's their decision in light of all the beautiful truth of the gospel. So many say, not for me. <laughs> I'm going to do it my way. I got me a plan. The Bible says man's plans end in death. That ultimately is going to lead to destruction. Folks, the spirit and the story of Christmas is the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The love of God demonstrated toward each of us. Let's bow together. Simple prayer this morning. Father, thank you for the hope that comes in Jesus Christ. Please help me to remember and help all of us in this room remember that you will complete and finish what you've begun in each of us through Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.